being a fan of the horror genre, I watch and read a good deal of horror fiction, as you might imagine. And there are definitely passages from horror novels and horror short stories and scenes from horror films or TV series that have given me lingering chills and troubling dreams. But some of the things that have frightened me most in my life that I've read about or watched have come from works of nonfiction, documentaries or nonfiction literature, and not necessarily covering subject matter you might be thinking of. For instance, I've never really been into true crime or real-world serial killers or anything along those lines. I've read some books on those subjects here or there, but by and large that's not my bag. Though I can understand the appeal of it, I think, for others. Far be it from me to act as though I find the subject matter too morbid to be of deep interest to anyone. I'm not making a judgment call here. Certainly not when one of my interests has long been disasters, man-made or natural. Some of the images and sentences related to disasters that have stuck with me and really gotten under my skin involve the threat of bodies of water, for example. Something that we can all potentially enjoy and play in as long as it has the uh, proper temperature, it's not too cold, and a proper temperament, it's not too wild and reckless. And as long as the option to get out of the water is near enough for us to actually get out of the water. when. Any of those things are not the case. Those are not the conditions. When the waves are too high, or the water is too frigid, or there's no safe haven close enough to swim to, or maybe even not even close enough for us to see, just the thought of that can make me a little bit uneasy. Images of the Andrea Doria, the ocean liner that infamously sank in 1956, seeing it in its final moments, stricken, listing in the middle of the ocean, Those images I've seen, the footage of it uh, in those final moments, even though I've gone back to it time and time again, each time, it it fills me with a bit of dread. And yes, that was more of a man-made disaster than a natural disaster, being that the ship was speared by another ship, although fog did play a role in, in why both of these ships collided. But ultimately, nature, water, is what takes the vessel down and is what is the ultimate threat to the vessel, albeit the sinking happened slowly enough to allow time for rescuers to evacuate most of the passengers, so at least it was not quite as tragic an event as it could have been, although 46 people did sadly still lose their lives. Still, seeing the ship on its side, where it's not supposed to be, and knowing that more than enough seawater to drown a 10-story building is what waits underneath it, that fills me with a certain sense of dread, and that by ocean depth standards, I know, is practically shallow. So thinking of other vessels that have sank in even deeper, much, much deeper waters uh, has a certain effect on me as well. There are other ships that will give me goosebumps just thinking about them, certainly uh, more so when I see the pictures. Old pictures of the doomed ship, the SS Princess Sophia, which ran aground in what is called the Graveyard of the Pacific, so that's already ominous, those have an effect on me. The Princess Sophia ran aground and ran into trouble while surrounded by ships that might have helped, but different factors, including the disastrous results of similarly stricken ships in that same area trying to evacuate passengers via lifeboats, and the lifeboats did not survive in turbulent waters. Uh, All of these different factors resulted in the captain delaying a potential evacuation until it was too late and then a storm came in and rendered rescue impossible. Images of that ship stuck on an outcropping surrounded by choppy unforgiving waters and a storm that is uh, blowing you know the, the wind and waves and, and really putting the ship in inevitable peril eventually going to push it off of the rocks and underneath the surface of the water. Those images strike me as incredibly eerie. Again, a sinking ship can be the product of human fallibility or aggression, uh, but in most cases, at least during peacetime, the biggest threat still posed is Mother Nature. There's not an explosion that necessarily is always the, the biggest threat. Sometimes ships catch fire, but even in those situations, nature is at play. The water an element that we can't survive without, but also can't survive within, is one of, if not the biggest threats 
factoring into the circumstances. And this is the same for other elements and components of the natural world that we enjoy or even use and possibly even rely on, but that can also inspire awe and fear and do horrifying damage when given to us in extreme excess. Who, for instance, doesn't love a pleasant breeze that can cool us off on a hot day? Insufficient wind can be turned into a natural source of electrical power, and on a windy day you can fly a kite and have a little fun doing that, but when it blows too strong, or when it comes with a storm, it can be one of the most frightening forces on Earth. Incidentally, as much horror fiction as I've consumed that has given me nightmares, I've had more bad dreams about tornadoes than anything else I've ever dreamt of, and that's without actually having seen one in person, so I can't imagine how traumatic that would be to have actually seen one and been through one in person, and I'm sure my, my dreams would be so flooded with tornadoes if that were the case that I wouldn't really have room in my mind for just about anything else. Likewise, the ground we walk on is also where we plant seeds for our food to grow, where the trees that produce oxygen for us to breathe are rooted, and we think of it as so stable that the first definition of grounded, when you look it up, is well-balanced and sensible not volatile, not in any way off-kilter or unpredictable. Not until it starts moving. Not only are earthquakes frightening and devastating on their own, they can spur other disasters to join the carnage, triggering volcanic eruptions or tsunamis or starting fires that all but consume a city like what happened to San Francisco in 1906. Back to the water, though. One of the scariest sentences I can recall ever reading in any book came from Eric Larson's account of the Galveston hurricane, the deadliest natural disaster in United States history, and that book is Isaac Storm. There is a moment where people inside a house are faced with a storm surge that makes the water level on the already flooded island rise four feet in a matter of seconds. Larson writes of this raise in the water level, this was not a wave, but the sea itself. Somehow that distinction made it all the more horrifying to me. At that point, nothing and no one on the island was effectively on a flooded island anymore. They were in the Gulf of Mexico in the midst, again, of the deadliest storm in United States history. I can only try to imagine and hope to never actually experience how ferociously violent and seemingly endless such an event must seem. It is little wonder to me such natural disasters were once blamed on monsters and deities in ancient times and are still regarded as modern legends in more recent decades. Some leave behind mysteries that offer no satisfactory explanation. Was the tri-state tornado really just a uniquely devastating single continuous tornado or an unusually severe family of fast-moving tornadoes that maintained the same track. Other disasters might keep us in suspense when we look at them from this historical perspective. When will the next inevitable massive Cascadian earthquake occur? How much damage is it going to do? Is it truly going to be as catastrophic as it's capable of being? Other disasters can leave us with a lingering sense of dread for the future. How much more frequent and severe will future wildfires and tropical cyclones become in response to our changing climate? Again, legends and modern mythology have been built around historical disasters. When I was young, on the Mississippi coast, before Katrina, there was the legacy of Hurricane Camille, which struck in 1969. Years and years later, there was a sub-history surrounding the storm when I was a, a kid there living on the coast. And some of that history was based in fact, some fabricated or exaggerated. And that extended beyond just what people in that area knew. That was something that was part of, of the knowledge or the misinformation in some cases that spread around the country. There was the infamous story of the Hurricane Party, for instance, which actually appeared in an episode of the TV series Quantum Leap. And nowadays, just about anyone who cares to do uh, proper research into it knows that that story is apocryphal. There was no actual hurricane party in an apartment building and everybody 
uh, met their fate because they refused to evacuate and instead decided to try to celebrate the, uh, the hurricane. That's not a, a true thing that happened, but when I was a kid, that was still being taken as truth, taken at face value. There were also physical artifacts of the storm. There was a boat it had lifted out of the water and deposited inland, and it had been left there years and years later as a sort of monument to the power of the storm surge. There was the island, ship island, that it had cut in two, and you'd hear about that as well. This, this island used to be a single island. Hurricane Camille came and permanently divided that island. There were great houses which, having withstood Camille, were seen as legendarily immovable objects, things that could withstand any storm that is going to come in the future because Camille was the most powerful upon landfall to have ever stricken the United States. So if a house could withstand Camille, it could withstand anything, surely. Some of those same houses would be swept away by Katrina, which was not actually as strong or as a intense measurably as Camille when it made landfall, but it was significantly, significantly larger and it moved much slower, meaning it had more time to do eventually greater and more lasting damage. The legend of Camille ultimately saved some lives while costing others when Katrina came. It prompted some people to flee to safety, knowing what such a major storm was capable of, while it caused others to sadly make the mistake of believing the haven that had sheltered them through Camille would be just as safe a little over a quarter century later. This was a product not only of the facts of what had happened before, but the stories, the legends as well. Horror art and fiction have been inspired by natural disasters or ominous weather, and they've incorporated those things in their stories, often using them metaphorically or in conjunction with supernatural horrors, or to set a scene for a frightening event, or as a device to keep characters trapped with some form of killer. Edvard Munch's painting, The Scream, is famously partially inspired by the red skies that could be seen over Norway and all over the world, really, that were the lingering effect of the eruption of Krakatoa. Stephen King's Storm of the Century sees a powerful blizzard follow a demonic figure onto an island, in part a reflection of the demon's power, but it's also a way to keep the locals isolated and subject to the demon's whims. The horrors of the Chilean-American co-production Aftershock are initiated by a massive earthquake, but ultimately end up having to do more with human depravity than a natural calamity. Tim Lebin's novella, White, features a ruinous abundance of snow that acts as a sort of supernatural terraformation for strange beings determined to claim the Earth and that pose a threat to humankind. And one of my favorite novels, Michelle Paver's Dark Matter, is set in an inhospitably icy landscape which considerably enhances the tale's ghostly terrors. And of course, countless, countless horror stories and suspense stories take place in a heavy downpour accompanied by no shortage of thunder and lightning. All of that having been said, it's a rarity to find a horror story in which the primary antagonist is nature itself. That is primarily the domain of disaster fiction, and even those stories frequently feature a human villain that gives the audience a name, a voice, and a face to hate. Some bureaucrat who cut corners on a safety measure, or someone whose cowardice threatens to make the entire situation somehow even worse and gets other characters killed, or some guy who's a little too arrogant and reckless when facing nature's fury, maybe he thinks he knows the way to escape, and again possibly gets other characters killed. Most disaster or man versus nature stories are more concerned with survivalism, excitement, and perseverance than intimate individual or small group fear. Even the horrifying moments are often presented as potentially thrilling, a giant wave crashing into and destroying the Golden Gate Bridge in the film San Andreas. That's much more of a visual spectacle than an examination of the fear such an event would inspire. Oftentimes, as well, in disaster films, these events are presented from such a conceptual height, uh, s such a wide-scale or, or large-scale view, that they fall into the a million is a statistic category. Even the least interesting teenage slasher victim, by comparison, though underdeveloped, is rarely faceless or nameless. We know who they are, even if they're just 
a certain kind of stock character type. They're not among the faceless masses being swept away by a disaster, as is the case in many disaster films. Such intimacy and focus on fear is often what distinguishes a horror film. Still, there are disaster films that give us a glimpse of such fear of nature's power, and it needn't be a long, lingering moment to be effective. When I was young, I first saw the film The Devil at 4 o'clock on television. It's the story of an impending, catastrophic volcanic eruption that will obliterate an island in the efforts of some men, including a brave local priest played by Spencer Tracy and a convict played by a still skinny Frank Sinatra to move the island's residents to safety. It's a solidly entertaining early 60s adventure drama, and there's never any doubt, of course, that Spencer and Frank and the others will be able to get the island's many innocents, including many children, onto boats and into the clear in time. However, when one of Sinatra's fellow convicts, a man named Charlie, played by Bernie Hamilton, sacrifices himself to help the others, it dominoes into Spencer and Frank also staying behind to face the titular figurative devil that is the volcanic eruption. And when the time comes for that eruption, the last time we see these tough, brave men, they do not appear stoic or defiant or at peace in their final moments. Nothing of the sort. We get a close-up of Spencer and Frank as they face the mountain, and they are both plainly awed and terrified of what is about to happen. There is something especially frightening to me about seeing an ostensibly brave or tough person be scared. It's one thing to see a character who you expect to be easily scared screaming their head off. Typical teenage victims in a slasher film, for instance, are of course going to be horrified by the killer swinging a sharp object at them. And when executed well, those scenes can still be effective, of course. But when you hear a scream or a gasp or even just see a startled stare from someone you don't expect to react that way, even though it's still natural and sensible for them to react that way, that can have a greater impact. And another story also sees the threat of nature erode a person's courage. Although by the time we meet the character in this story, he's already been whittled down to seeming insanity. Except he's not insane, just burdened with a horrific truth. And in this rare case, nature itself is truly, purely the villain of the story that is firmly planted within the horror genre. It's a short story, and a great one, that can be found in Ray Bradbury's collection, The October Country. Its title is also the name of its evil. The Wind What if a force of nature was sentient? What if it grew more intelligent with every person it killed, absorbing the minds of many into its being? What if you discovered this, and that force of nature realized this, and hunted you across the globe to kill you to keep it secret? What would you do? Where would you go? Where in the world could you hide from something integral to the world itself? This is the inescapable problem faced by a man named Alan in Ray Bradbury's The Wind. It is, at an immediate level, a very human story centered on Alan and more so his friend Herb Thompson. The titular wind could be seen as purely a device, a means by which to deliver a story about how far you are willing to go to help a friend, what you're willing to believe for them, what you can't bring yourself to believe about them. It's not just that Herb can't believe what Alan claims is happening to him is actually happening, for instance. He cannot truly believe that Alan himself even believes it, and so he's unwilling to demand or try to encourage Alan to seek professional psychological help until Herb gets persuaded by his wife and her friends to try to have Alan seek help. You might think the least Herb could do for Alan, besides pretending to humor his stories about the wind stalking him around the world, is look into whatever kind of treatment might be beneficial to him given his mental condition. But Herb doesn't do that, not out of plot convenience and not out of a, a carelessness or a disregard for his friend's well-being, but simply because he sincerely seems to struggle with the reality of his friend's mental state, given what he knew about him before everything took place. The human element is, of course, critical. It's what makes the story excellent instead of just a good idea. 
you feel for Alan, for Herb, even for Herb's wife, who, like so many wives in such stories, is the voice of reason who might come off as a little bit, um, shrewish, let's say, only because you know the genre of the story that you're reading and therefore know from the beginning that all of her logic and reasoning is impossibly wrong, so that puts her in an unfair position, obviously, and further discussion of that and dissection of that is probably saved for a, a different podcast. Still, the wind itself is also important to this story, just as important as the human character element. Yes, Bradbury could have potentially traded out the wind for a different component of nature, for rain, or snow, or fire, or dirt. Michael McDowell once effectively made a villain out of sand in The Elementals, a book I've mentioned before and ought to revisit soon. I really, really like it, and I can't recommend it enough. But out of all those different components of nature that I've mentioned here, I think there is something specifically eerie about the wind itself and something sinister about the idea of the wind lifting and carrying the voices and souls of the countless people who have died in storms throughout history and even prehistory along with it. There is something scary about having to keep the wind, air itself, while it is on the move, away from you and outside of whatever it is that you're trying to shelter within. It might be challenging to avoid quantities of water large enough to do you harm, but I wouldn't say that's necessarily impossible. And earth and fire would pose a challenge as well, but neither of those are as swift or as omnipresent as the air you have to breathe. Alan happened upon the secret of the wind by mistake. A war veteran, he ventured into what he calls the Valley of the Wind in the Himalayas, so he says. And this is how he discovered wind's true nature. Herb talks glowingly of Alan, and he's clearly a learned, well-traveled man, but all we know as an audience, all we really get to experience of him, of Alan, is what's left after all that he has suffered. After his ordeal in the mountains, he's encountered ferocious storms in various other places across the planet that have killed many, many others, but that he has always escaped from. Now, nature no longer seems content to capture him in a place where it might also kill others en masse. It is coming to his front door. It is literally going to blow his house down to get to him. And while he retreats or tries to retreat to get away from it, all he can really think to do is repeatedly call his friend just to hear a compassionate voice and a caring word. And there's really only so much Herb can do to offer him even that. And Alan vacillates in the conversations he has with Herb, in between telling Herb he wishes that he could come over, and also telling Herb to just stay put, to not endanger himself. He doesn't really know what to do or what he wants at this point. He eventually just asks Herb, who's having guests over, how his evening is going, whether he's enjoying his evening, whether he's smoking a cigar, if he's having a nice, normal night just so he can know that there is some normalcy out there while there is madness beating down the walls of his house. This ties into something that I think about any time I read about people caught in the midst of a storm or an earthquake or other natural catastrophe, especially when I read about these events when they happened in the time that predates anything close to our modern era of communication. From back when a hurricane could sweep into the northeast so swiftly that it could catch people out on the beach having a picnic with no idea that a hurricane is coming, which occurred with the 1938 hurricane sometimes called the Long Island Express. Back when news of a disaster that happened miles and miles away, possibly on the other side of the world, couldn't reach you within hours of it happening, much less minutes of it happening. You might not find out until a day later at best that, for instance, a volcanic eruption occurred that wiped out an entire island community in the Caribbean. I think of people who suffered through events in those eras, in those times, and out of a, a sense of empathy and kind of a, a morbid curiosity to explore my fears, I do try to imagine what it must have been like to effectively feel that all of reality is coming undone around you with no sense of the idea of when people are going to be able to reach you, when anybody's going to be able to communicate with you again. This is an era when a disaster 
would really effectively cut people off from the rest of the world and basically shrink your world down to where the disaster took place in that moment. In David McCullough's account of the Johnstown Flood, an event which, to be clear, was significantly man-made and not just a product of heavy rains, but in that book, he quotes one woman from one household telling a child in that house simply that this is the end of the world. When the flood comes in, when the giant wall of water from the failed dam comes crashing through Johnstown, to her it felt like the end of the world. And just because her statement is obviously inaccurate in terms of, you know, the world, the entire world is not ending, that doesn't mean she's by any means exaggerating in the sense of her emotional fear and what she must have felt to see that giant, you know, wall of water crashing down through your town without any real significant warning of what was going to happen in this unprecedented event in American history. And that is, of course, not to say that people in modern times don't maybe have these same feelings as well, but we at least do have more forewarning about what's going to take place and a greater understanding of what is taking place in the moment, even if sometimes, depending on what's happening, the knowledge, all of that knowledge, is essentially useless to us because nature is overpowering all of our attempts to make ourselves safer. Ultimately, knowing that it's not a monster whipping up the storm or some great beast underwater that has pushed a giant wave onto the shore, some god chained up underground and struggling to break free from his restraints that is causing the earthquakes, the fact that we know all of that might not make us any safer if the earthquake is strong enough or the storm is powerful enough or the wave comes in swiftly enough and high enough. The power of nature has a way of erasing what we believe to be rational and sensible. It can make land move in waves like water. It can generate a storm with powerful enough, strong enough winds to turn roof shingles into flying deadly projectiles. It can brutally reveal to us the truth about our own fragility, something that is too frightening for many of us to contemplate or want to face. And I think Bradbury's story captures that extremely well. Bradbury was great at that sort of thing, capturing the emotional fear that makes an individual tragedy seem like something apocalyptic, a send-off for the entirety of humanity. He does that extraordinarily well in the short story Kaleidoscope, for example, and he does it again in The Wind. Alan's last phone call with Herb almost feels like a hopeless last broadcast from a dying reality, and in a small way, that's what it is, because after Herb finds out the truth about what has happened to his friend, his reality is forever altered. He's now faced with the knowledge of what nature can really be. Not only dangerous, but in this world, malicious. And that knowledge is what made Alan a target in the first place. Thank you for listening to episode 10 of the Healthy Fears podcast. And if you're listening to this at the time of this episode's release, then happy October to you. It has been a rough year, but we have made it to October, one of my favorite months of the year. And somehow, some way, I hope that this October is a good one. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, feel free to subscribe leave a review or a rating on your podcast platform of choice if it allows you to interact with the podcast that way. Tell a friend about the podcast as well if you enjoy it. Share it on your social media platforms or just share it with somebody that you're hopefully having some kind of direct interaction with at some point here. We want to maintain that human connection. If you would like to read any of my writing fiction or otherwise, you can find a full list of my publication credits as well as things that I blog about on my website, johnnycompton.com. One way or another, in the meantime, until you hear from me again, maybe try not to get on Mother Nature's bad side. Stay safe out there.